Welcome back, Billiken fans. It's a new year. Same podcast. Zach Miller, Peter Hale. It's the Midtown Madness. Before we get going, thank you so much for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Don't forget to comment. You guys have been doing great. We had a little bit of down on the comments. Even if it's just like, you're wrong, Ford's great, or fire Ford, hit the comments down below. Uh, please. Um, it really does help. Uh, it's season four, and once again, the Midtown Madness podcast is brought to you by Two Men and a Garden. Pete, uh, I did, in fact, pick up uh, Two Men and a Garden medium uh, salsa with the with chips. I think I got the Tostitos brand chips. By the way, Two Men and a Garden, we need chips. I think I think Two Men and a Garden branded chips would be a great addition to the lineup. Um, just do something funky with it, but... Uh, yeah, I got that and I made it part of the Rob Your Neighbor gift exchange at my family Christmas Inn. Uh, the the youngest, most picky eater uh, was the one to come away with this. Yeah, You're not the most picky eater in your family? I, I am not. I am not. But <laughs> but that's only because uh, she's in like second grade. I see. So, I see. So yeah, I, but you know, um, but yeah, she was not happy to receive this. But I said, look, Try it, let your parents know if you like it, and I can throw it in as part of my ad read. Because if you like it, it'd be like Life Cereal. Mikey likes it. Uh, it would be just like that. It would be perfect. But if you are a person with discerning taste, a grown-up with discerning taste, and, and you love salsa, head over to twomanandagarden.com and pick up. Uh, they have all their products there. Now, you can find them in any local grocery store, but if you are particular about your salsa, you want to get on their website, twomenandagarden.com. Follow them on social media at Two Men Salsa on Instagram and Twitter. Pete, New Year, New Billikens, right? I hope so, Zach. I, this, I feel weird right now. I got to say, this is the longest stretch I think we've ever had that's not COVID-related Yeah, between games of men's basketball we shall and not speak that word on the podcast i don't know if that's true i can't prove it i'm sure there was a time in the 20s where they were taking like five day train to trips a, yeah. to new mexico or oh, whatever yeah. to they, uh they had, to take, so, they had to take a boat down the mississippi river to play tulane <laughs> exactly so yeah. so I, i'm sure there were times uh you know a, a century ago or the better part of a century ago that, that we went this long but it certainly doesn't feel like as long as i've been paying attention that we've just had a solid two week block that hasn't been COVID related. So I'm going to say it's, it's a weird feeling. I hope it's a lot of time to get healthy, to reset. I think sincere Parker, by the way, is, is practicing again, uh, which is a great sign. So maybe we really will see a new version of this team in 2024. I mean, I really hope we have a new Billiken defense. That's for sure. Because yeah. I know our guys over at West Pine bills have been hammering that point uh, that uh, in fact, nothing, not, not only is uh, it's changed and not for the good since as a entered the lineup, uh, but as has been fantastic on the offensive end, let's not, let's not make any mistake there. Uh, do you like this long break? Because I freaking hate it. I think it's awful. Uh, I think it's a horrible decision, but I mean, what are you going to do? I, I don't like it either as a fan, as if as someone who actually cares about the human beings who play this game, it's nice that they got a little more of a break. That makes one of us. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's nice that they got a little bit more of a break. Hopefully they all got a chance to to either go home or go somewhere fun and uh, and relax a little bit and reset. And and like I said before, get healthy, you know, like I, guys are nursing some lingering injuries um, and I, I just I'd want to see as close to a hundred percent as possible during conference play, because uh, I really want to see what we've got here, you know, and, and, and no excuses, no reasons why we might not be performing up to expectations or, or whatever. I just want to see them get out there at full strength and, and do what they can. Do we think that this team will run more now at full strength? I don't know. I don't think, I don't think we're going to see a big <laughs> style change. Yeah. I'm just going to be honest. I, uh, I don't. I don't expect anything major stylistically to change. Uh, uh, I'm. Ju I'm just hoping that with a little uh, more reinforcements on the personnel side, that we see something different. Pete, I want to touch on on a point 
that, that went on. We're going to get into the women's basketball game against Rhode Island. Uh, and but but usually I want to, you know, uh, uh, there was a crossover with this game, right? Because for uh, one of the first times, and I don't know if it's going to happen again, it might happen again. Um, but uh, I'm trying to see. So the men are at Rhode Island on March 2nd. Uh, I don't know where Rhode Island is then, but because of the crossover, um, uh, Tenen Magasa, who plays for Rhode Island, also a Dayton, uh, Dayton tra- transfer from Dayton. Transfer, and right. yeah, and Abu Magasa, brother and sister, were at the same place at the same time here in St. Louis. And and Rhode Island women's basketball took the time to post about it. And, and I feel a little crazy that like slew men's basketball didn't do that. Like didn't point this out. I thought they did, Zach. I, I before before we say like yeah, they true. Didn't I? Yeah, no, they. I, you know what? I think they just retweeted the women's the uh, Rhode Island women's basketball tweet. Um. So so Ro- Rhodey women's basketball at Rhodey WBB on December thirtieth tweeted Magasa siblings link up in St. Louis with a blue heart. And then it said at Atlantic 10 family ties and they tweeted at St. Louis MBB, um, you know, the official account. And there's a picture of Ten and Abu, uh, you know, with his arm on her and there's they're like in the tunnel, you know, under the under Shafitz, you could even see a rack of basketballs in the, in the background, uh, you know, in the tunnel going out to the floor. So it's a good picture. It's cool to see, you know, them be able to link up. Um, you're, you're right. I guess it was just the roadie women's basketball account that tweeted it and they just retweeted it. But, um, but at least they did that. You know, I don't, I don't know if they necessarily needed to do their own thing or not, but it's, it's, it's cool nonetheless. And I'm going to look up their women's basketball schedule right now. You said we're there. The men are there on March 2nd. Yeah. Okay. So the women are at date. Okay. So so we, uh, we don't get to keep receipts here. (laughs) <laughs> I guess not. Uh, but yeah, so so it looks like it looks like they will not be in the same place at the same time again, unless there's like a weird weekend where like, you know, slew men's basketball and um, Rhode Island women's are both at like at UMass or at St. Joe's the same weekend or something like that, which I suppose is possible. But uh, I'm not going to do all that work right here on the fly. Yeah, I wouldn't either. I, I barely do <laughs> any work in my day to day. Um, Pete, there's a note here and I'm going to be honest with you. You put it in here and I had no idea that it, it had any application to St. Louis university basketball, but you, you kind of were explaining to me that, that the Florida state ACC lawsuit, which again, I don't know much about it other than they're mad at their conference for not getting, um, getting a, a bid to the college football playoff. Yeah, so th- that's I mean that's part of it. So so basically, what is happening here, and I'll I'll explain why this relates to SLU. But last week, Florida State's board voted to sue the ACC over what's called grant of rights, alleging restraint of trade, breach of contract, and failure to perform over what the school describes as years of mismanagement that has locked ACC schools in a quote deteriorating media rights agreement while preventing schools from leaving with quote again draconian withdrawal penalties um so as you said florida state missed the college football playoff despite having an undefeated record this year and it seems like this was the final straw for the school i think florida state had already been unhappy with the acc it's clearly behind the other big power conferences in terms of football and that's kind of acted to sort of penalize clemson and fsu and the other schools that are kind of at the top of the of the pile in in football in that conference they're just not seen and and given credit for being as strong as say an sec or a big 10 school um so the acc has an exit fee of 130 million dollars that they implemented after maryland left a decade ago and what that was intended to do was strengthen the league against poaching and lock down long-term media rights deals so florida state estimates that all in leaving leaving the league would cost the school 572 million between that exit fee, lost media rights revenue, and unreimbursed broadcast fees. Now, some of that number looks so big because of the lost media rights revenue, and I would assume that you would, if you went to another conference, you would get some sort of media rights revenue. So 
that's the that's like the complete downside and i don't think that's like a real number necessarily the league's deal with espn goes through 2036 though so that's why it looks like such a big number now the bottom line for us why is this potentially bad for slu at this point no other acc schools are jumping into the suit everyone seems to be taking a wait and see approach so that also means that other leagues and their member schools are taking the same approach meaning no one is being proactive right now because if this lawsuit leads to the collapse of the ACC, there's going to be a feeding frenzy. So AC schools, ACC schools that don't wind up in the Big Ten, SEC, or Big 12 might look at other options um, the way that we su- that way, the way that we see Washington State and Oregon State doing, you know? Um, so they might look at something like the Big East. And if if there's like a you know, Duke's not any good at football, right? I I, I don't think they're they're pretty good. I think okay. they 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 pop up in the top twenty five every couple of years. But say there's only so many spots to give in the SEC, in the Big Ten, Big Twelve, and there's a few ACC schools looking for a home. They're probably going to look more attractive to the Big East than SLU and Dayton and VCU and the schools that we think of as potential Big East expansion teams, programs, schools. So that. I think is going to cause a lot of other leagues right now to just wait. And so in the meantime, the big East just, they have no reason to grow their membership. Right. I mean, like I I just, I wouldn't jump at a slew or Dayton, uh, before you find out what's going to happen with that conference in a year or two, or when all of this shakes out. So the bottom line here is the conference shuffle is not over. Football is the giant monster driving this and destroying everything in its path. And SLU needs to put itself in a position to look as attractive as possible to the Big East at all times, which means getting men's basketball in shape ASAP to look like a program that can be competitive in a sustainable way. And I apologize for saying ASAP there, Zach. I don't like that. It's just how I had it in the notes. But the, the, the point is, the point is we, we may have a little bit of a window here, like a little bit yeah. of time to kind of get the ship righted, to get yeah. things looking good, to look more attractive. We know our facilities are there. We know a lot of our non-revenue uh, sports are in, in good shape right now. There's there's a lot to like about the school, the market, et cetera. Got to get men's basketball up to snuff, though, um, you know, because, like I said, the, the conference shuffle is not over, and we still have a shot. Yeah, I, I really like that take at the end because as you were reading it, um, some of the stuff I like to wait a little bit to really get into meat and potatoes and let you talk about it, and then I can understand it because dumb, dumb brain. Uh, but, like, that makes sense, and it, it actually is a, you know, you started why this potentially is bad for SLU. This could end up being, as long as the ACC doesn't collapse, a, a, a positive step for SLU given that it's it's allowing them to kind of, like you said, get the cards in order ASAP. Yeah, that, that is what I said, isn't it? Yes. I guess it's important to note here that that I've read like three different legal analyses of like this case and like why. You really are. You really are built different. Well, <laughs> but but the, <laughs> the, my take my takeaway is really nothing that I want to add to the to the conversation here because nobody knows. Like they they really don't have a good indication of where this case is going. Um, it, people seem to think it, it's a pretty even chance that Florida State or the ACC wins, and and there might even be some sort of compromise where they neither looks like a clear winner or clear loser. Um, and then the the other factor is they don't know how long this is going to take. If this really becomes a full trial, it could take a couple of years, and then you got to think either party is going to appeal the decision after that, right? Like either party who lo- on the losing end of this thing. So it, it could be years. We have no idea what it means. And that's really what's, I think, going to cause everybody else to take a wait and see approach. So um, I, I anyway, I think you're right. I, I, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. There is a potential positive outcome here. I, and maybe that means the ACC staying intact and then the Big East going, okay, we need to act. We need to expand. Um, that's one version of a potential positive outcome for Slu. Um, one one thing I, I don't even remember if we got into it, but it, one of the out and we don't have it in the notes, but it just occurred to me is this this uh, the the new um, kind of uh, NIL strategy that uh, the Billiken Victory Fund and Troy Robertson and 
uh, 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 I guess we'll say a handful now because it's been three in the commercials, but there's now two commercials with three Billiken players in them for the Robertson, Petcher, and some other person that's not a Billiken name that I, I, I didn't memorize. Um, their uh, real estate group, uh, and it's been uh, Gibson Jimerson, uh, I almost said Madani Jara for some reason. Uh, Brad Azawiro and Bruce Zhang. Uh, Pete, I, I think we both agreed that uh, I think uh, Gibson Jimerson was the surprise uh, star of that. Like he was a, he was decent in that commercial. Subtle acting chops. I think, uh, you know, his, his veteran experience really shows there. Yes. Uh, maybe he took a drama class or two or something. I don't know. Uh, he's got it though. And um, yeah, I think the, what's funny, Zach, and I think I said this last time, is this is kind of what we had in mind when NIL came about, right? Yeah. Like we thought it was going to be Emos and Lufus and Bomberito and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and and so here they are doing a very local commercial. I don't know whether, I don't know what to think about the fact that it's for Troy's company and no. he's the head of the BVF. And you think like, um, wow, we I all, see that. Well, I want to yeah. see the receipts. What, what are we laundering money through the through, <laughs> through the Troy's real estate group? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't. I think it's pretty at least transparent in this case. Like, no, it's 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 all up and up. But it's I don't know whether to. I, I'd like to see them getting out in front of the camera for some other companies as well, right? And not just yeah, not just the guy who's who's running the BVF. I've, I've all, you know, it's interesting that you you talk about getting out in front of the big companies and. I just wonder how, like, are are these collectives? These collectives really should be like the business owners in the community, yeah. or or it should be like a group of people that are managerial, like a manager staff, like like that uh, that Italian guy that uh, Tommy DeVito, like he went and did the pizza appearance or whatever. I don't know. It right. feels like it feels like the people in the Billiken Victory Fund should be the ones going out and brokering these deals. Like that should, should be they should be like almost like a volunteer manage manager service. Yeah. So I have uh, a lot of notes from. A I know. I I, I, I'm excited the, about that. And we're not going to get into it this week because I do want to give Troy or anyone else. Um, from the BVF a chance to come on the show first. And we've asked yeah. and we're, we're trying, we're in the process of that. We're going to try and get them on, give them a little more time. And if we're not able to do it, then I'll go ahead and, and, and read what I've got. But, um, they, they, he, long story short is it just kind of depends like how the school wants to set it up. Yeah. But in terms of, of brokering the deals, I think they're the ones who have to, um, you know, the people like, I don't think the deal can technically be brokered by a, a the coach school, or staff, but member. it could be brokered by the individual themselves. Correct. Yeah. The athlete. Yeah. Right. Sure. Uh, but uh, like, my thing is, I, I wonder if, if the Billiken victory fund as it pertains to SLU is better off. Like, why aren't they, instead of asking for donations just to like, again, launder money. Uh, yeah. and that's, that's the simplistic view of it, but that's kind of the, the best, most visceral, uh, descriptor for what's mm -hmm. happened instead of bringing in donations to then funnel to the players. Why isn't the Billiken victory fund going out? Like that's really, I think where we could do better is ha have these, these people in, in the Billiken victory fund be the like local business people that have connections that are able to go and match up a guy like Terrence Hargrove with like, I, I I'm not kidding you. Like he should be doing advertisements for sky zone. Yeah. Like that's perfect for him. Go out and play with the kids, slam dunk on the, on the, uh, yeah. on the trampoline basketball hoop fly. Like he's the athletic guy. Like go do like advertisements for that. That's perfect. Like I feel like they should be out in the community meeting with, you know, like Jimerson is obviously the putt shack guy. I just come on, like, you know, so, Patrick Schulte would be the putt shack guy, right? The top Patrick Schulte should be the top golf guy. I, he's an MLS champion now. I mean, yes, he's, he he's going to have some different options, but I, I think 
it, what there there might what might be missing from the marketplace is the sort of like because you can you can go on to SLU's official athletics website and so, register for their um you know the the whatever they call the the site where you can actually get in touch with a player and make offers and it like so so you can go there you can register so if you're a local business there's nothing stopping you from doing that directly you yeah, don't have to go yeah, you don't have to go through the Bill and Victory Fund. You don't have to go through the school. You can go right to the players through that, but you do have to sign up and register. So there's at least a, a little barrier, right? Like you and I just can't email them directly without signing up. I mean, up I first. guess we could. We could. We would just have to like register and everything. See, I don't. Um, I, I really hate that you have to register for before seeing. Like I, I before hate, seeing like the fees and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. like th there are a lot of other schools where you can just go see what the what the players offer, like you know, appearance fee so much. They'll do like a, a cameo style video greeting for so much. They'll do... Like, do they have to, do they have to uh, authorize us? Like, like, is there some, is there a human on the other end authorizing this? Or is it? it? Yeah. Or is it just like, is it like registering for Billikins.com? So my understanding is they would have to like report it to the athletic department and then it would be cleared. Like, so, so I if think... we, if we as a podcast just registered so that I could go, view the prices and whatnot like that would not be acceptable no i think i think it is i think what would not be acceptable is if you were trying to i don't know like say like because what's to stop some creep from signing up and trying to get like a slew women's sure. athlete or cheerleader or something to like try and show up and like you know what i mean like some there's a there's a there's an actual player safety element to right. this right oh 100 so, so i think it's it's once the contact is is like made and established and the player doesn't yes. have to re even respond but if there's something that like you know they're, they're, i think they want to clear everything through the school first once a negotiation mm -hmm. is being made um so anyway like i i think there's that but the the element that I do think is missing is is something like you said is is to where yeah that's not really what the big Billiken Victory Fund is but I do think there is I don't know how many businesses actually know they can do that right, right. like I, I think there's a little marketing aspect missing in terms of like hey come come use our athletes for promotions and for yeah. appearances or for camp you know weeks or whatever um, to to kind of to to let the community know like this is an option this is out there and it's affordable and maybe it makes sense for your business or your event or whatever um so so i do think there's there's probably an awareness marketing aspect to this that's kind of missing i should just i should just do this like i should just be uh like a like not an agent a manager a manager sure you know just can i just connect people there you uh, go. Yeah, it's I, I don't know, but anyway, back to the videos because I do want to point out that these videos are very funny. Yeah, they they have kind of I think what they're going for and and mostly getting is like the kind of uh, this is ESPN. This is Sports Center. Yeah, this, sorry, this is Sports Center campaign that ESPN sure. has been doing for decades now. Um, so it's kind of that it's that vibe, right? It's the local commercial version of that, and I think it's and I good. think I think they're kind of they are taking they're like a spiritual cousin of of the that 101 espn ad with the billiken uh but I, I, right. which, which brings up another question how has the billiken not been on a this is sports center ad like that see that that might be like the biggest upset of this past what what when did those start probably early mid 90s yeah, so like, like 95 to 2025 I think had in we, 30 had, years, how have we not? We're, we're, we're one deep tournament run away from having something like that. Happen, I swear, you know? I swear to God, if, if we make a deep tournament run one time, one yeah. time, Billiken mania people like people. And, and if you, if you have a, and I will go on record as saying Travis Ford hates the Billiken <laughs> um, because he just does like it, it, all the evidence is there. Um, but like, if you put the Billiken in front of people and we have a great team, like we were so close in 20, 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. I mean, that the country was ready for Billiken mania. All I want is the kind of tournament run or sustained success to where we don't need to see that graphic. No. In, in a national a, a broadcast game, the what is a Billiken? I don't want it as long as people are not asking that anymore, then we will have made it and I'll be I, happy with it. I, I think the only program that has reached major success where the mascot is not like 
And the mascot to, on this one is well known, but I yeah. think it takes a back seat is Gonzaga. Mm. Because they have Zags. Like, like if you asked the lay person that only watches the NCAA NCAA basketball during the tournament, yeah. I think they would call that they would think their nickname is the Zags. That's a good point. I mean, that's uh I guess I really hadn't thought of that. That their main mascot is not really part of the I mean, it's the logo you see that the bulldog, yeah. but yeah, it's not really part of the identity. They put Zags on the jersey, which is which, which that makes that that in a way that makes sense because Gonzaga, that word is so much more impactful than Bulldogs in the NCAA in the context of the entire NCAA. Sure. Yeah. Whereas Billiken, uh, what I'm saying is, please, for the love of Christ. Embrace the Billiken more. Like yeah. it, it is, it is the like. If you're looking at how how tough these last two years have been, like give us more Billiken stuff. Like make the Billiken front and center. Like we're tired of Team Blue. <laughs> like right. like I'm just not we. Like I, I am. I don't. I think you kind of are wavering on. Like I think you're you're frustrated with it in you know a lesser extent, less visceral way, but like. Give us the Billiken more. Like the Billiken makes every every Billiken fan happy. Like uh, the Billiken, like I don't know. Anyway, that's my tangent right. on that. But anyway, back to the commercials. Love to see the the tall, the the Bruce Young, uh, Brad as a Wero uh, commercial. I thought I, I was shocked to see Bruce because uh, again, uh, international students. You were like, oh, I thought they were not uh, eligible, but I guess it's just different paperwork. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I, I, we we had heard more or less that much from from Harriman when we had him on the show yeah. uh, when he was hired, right? I mean, it was he said it was it's really like it could be done. There are some timing things. There are some location things, but uh, they wrote they filmed like, that commercial in, uh, in, in uh, <laughs> yeah, that it's in China. Yeah, <laughs> that was uh, that that was that uh, Microsoft Binbo's uh, office. That's where they shot it. Do you have you ever seen that meme? Uh. Uh-uh. Oh, uh, it's a it's a building in China that is Microsoft Binbos is on the, it was on the side. If you go look it up, it's a dumb meme, but yeah, it's, right. it's an office space, like a knockoff China. thing. Yeah. No, it was like I think it was just like I think it means something different when you say it to a Chinese person. Like it's oh, not, it's I actually see. not. I'm mean, not. I don't know. Anyway, you just gotta look it up. There's a video. Yeah, sorry, not familiar matter. with it. But we're talking about bigs, Pete, and one thing that has just been baffling to me. Uh, you know, it, it it was at the forefront of Billikens.com for a hot minute and we put it in the notes and then we forgot about it. But mm. I want to talk about the front court turnover under Travis Ford. Um, it, it's, it's wild to me um, because oh, in the past, in Travis Ford's tenure at St. Louis University, he has had one four year big. Right. That was Hassan, Hassan French. French. Right. Yes. How like that is wild to me. So the conversation is specifically about bigs that we've brought in as freshmen, right? right. Or, or or yeah. Not guys that have come in as upperclassmen transfers, junior seniors. Right. That's that's not who we're talking about because yeah, we've cycled a lot of those guys in, but I think that's just part of the game now, right? When you're yeah. looking for a, a veteran big. So Hassan French is the one who's who's gone start to finish. We had Jimmy Bell go two years. I don't know if you want to count Casey Hankton or Andre Lawrence. So they probably don't really count as bigs. They're kind of was combo Casey forward. Hankton a, uh, was he a cruise recruit? No, 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 no. he wasn't. Okay. Um, but, but those are guys who, who came in and played for two seasons. Right. Right. And then you had the one year bigs that we've cycled through over the last three years, one a year, uh, Donnie Madani Jada, uh, Lasina Traore, who's tearing it up at Long Beach State now, and then Momo Sise, who's who's gone back to uh, who's gone down to a JUCO program for this year. Uh, so, so we've had those one year guys. We had Cartier Gordon, who obviously didn't last very long, uh, came in as a highly touted freshman. So, <laughs> I mean, w- when you look at that, Zach, like it seems like we're we're basically bringing in one new big a season, about, yeah. and they're just not lasting. They're either lasting one or two seasons. And I, 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 I guess the, the big question for me is 
what's the value in bringing them in if you're not going to to develop them if you're if you're if you're not going to coach them up i mean we haven't gotten an instant impact big since french and gordon i don't know if that's even possible again until we have our nil budget really shored up but if you're not going to be patient enough to develop these guys why even bother recruiting incoming freshman bigs are you just hoping to catch lightning in a bottle um are you hoping they show more right away like I don't know how much of this is the program being impatient with guys and how much is these guys being impatient? Like, well, I'm not getting minutes this season. I'm going to go somewhere I can get minutes. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know where most of the, the turnover is coming from. Yeah. I, I honestly, I, I, I would lean towards the turnover being on the side of the, the, the program, like the staff. I think that's kind of, you know, obviously, Cartier Gordon is a is a different animal altogether. That sure. situation, yeah, yeah. Um, but you look at Jara Cisse Triore, like those are guys that I mean came in and they were fan favorites. I I think they all so. Well, I mean, I, not they, they Jara, clearly, not Jara. No, like people Jara enjoy didn't really when they play. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it was more like Cisse Triore. Those were guys like they would come in and get the Bruce treatment. Sure. Like, like the early on Bruce. Yeah. Treatment, people right? are excited. They want to see how yeah. they do. And, and you know, you, you're willing to be a little more patient with a young guy. He's you're, you're forgiving yeah. of their mistakes. You'll laugh off a, a silly turnover when it bounces off their head. Uh, right. That's all. That's, that seems like a freshman big special here. It's yeah. Uh, um, But I think, you know, it, but again, like, I don't know if it's, you know, Travis Ford, we've seen, we've seen Travis get really mad at Bruce and, and like, and you're just kind of like, ah, like, uh, are you expecting too much out of these freshmen and, and are you letting them go early or are they just like, screw this? I, yeah, I don't really know what I, that, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, like specifically talking about the three guys um, who are, who were African players, uh, Troy, Cisse, Jada, they're all guys who came from Africa to prep schools in the U.S. And most of them bounced around a little bit once they were in high school, too. Right. So these are guys who have not been in the same place a long time at all. And that's a that man, maybe if we're ever looking for a subject, prep schools in, that, that have basketball programs in the United States is like a huge topic to me that that like a I big you know, rift. Like, oh my God, like, man, you have no, I like the, I, it's just like, like, I think of what's that documentary, the Bishop oh, Sycamore yeah, documentary about, about the football BS team. High, yeah. Now that, that, that was like specific to, you know, one dude in Columbus and, and getting kind of regional high school and Juco players to come play for this illegitimate um, school, this illegitimate program. But I, I mean, the, the prep basketball um landscape is pretty it's there's a lot of weird stuff going on there too and i worry about guys like that because because all three of these guys seem like really nice dudes i mean we had momo on the show yeah um obviously not the best english speaker french speaker primarily nice kid and i remember at the time what he said about slew that made it matter so much to him was he said they, their whole pitch was about family we're a family and like this was a, clearly a guy who wanted to kind of root down and spend some time somewhere and really establish himself. I, I would find it hard to believe that he opted to just leave and go to a junior college after one season. I think it was probably, I think it probably had more to do with Ford feeling the pressure of needing to win sooner than to develop a guy for three or four years um, in the wake of a disappointing season last year is, you know, my take on him anyway. So I think that's probably what's, what's going on with those guys. But I, and I do worry about guys like that getting lost in the shuffle because of the circumstances of them coming over to the U S and bouncing around a lot and stuff like that. I don't, I don't like seeing that happen. Right. Um, but again, that's the tip of a, a very, a very large iceberg of another conversation back to slew and developing these guys. Um, I think we can say with some confidence that at least some of them would have stayed knowing that their time would come later while they get up to speed and that we could have had some pretty solid big men as juniors and seniors. But yes. instead, what we're seeing is we're cycling through freshmen and transfers and never have them for more than two years. And I think that method is only as good uh, or better than developing longer term guys if every veteran tra transfer pans out. 
Yeah. Which includes being immediately eligible, by and, the way. And which, being able to get them. Yes. Which is, right. again, bonkers to me that we ended up with one big that was immediately, or that one transfer big that was not even immediately eligible. We had 40 minutes. Yeah. We had 40 minutes. Like, no. Yeah, I, I guess we had four. If you consider the way Travis uses bigs. Sure. We or, had or it has the last few years, yes, right? We had we had 40 minutes of playing time to get away. Give away. That means if you find a big who is fit, like that's he could play the whole game if he wanted to. So it just shows you how big a factor NIL is, right? Now. Yes. I, I mean, think like, so. Yeah, because if because if we're not there in that, I mean that's that's the reason we're not getting our first or second or third options. And that's that's the only way that this works is if you have a guy who's who's a serviceable starting five, but not well, not just serviceable but good. That's the situation, and and if you have him for more than one year, that's the situation where you have time to develop guys underneath him, right? Like this, if you've got a guy who who comes and then can't play for a while, or if you have a guy who comes and is just not as good as you needed him to be, um. Or, or if you've got you know more of a platoon situation and and fewer roster spots uh, for other bigs, it just doesn't work as well. And so, I I, I don't know. I think I I want to see how this strategy develops as NIL does because if we're going to be still be limited in terms of the NIL budget, I don't think they're going to have any choice but to keep some of the younger bigs around for longer. Yeah, I just I don't and I don't. Like like you said, we could have had a, a nice core of of decent bigs. I mean, they're not. You say you bring in. I mean, imagine this team with, uh, you know, and and God love Bruce Zhang and, and uh, uh, what's the other guy's name? I can't think of it right now. Steph. Steph. Yeah, Steph. God love them. They're yeah. trying hard. Uh, Bruce looks. Bruce is showing flashes, but like, imagine this team with with uh, Triore. And uh, I mean, Momo, I guess. I mean, those are two like Lucina is playing really, really well at Long Beach State. Momo's down to a Juco. I don't know. I mean, the last time we had a, a player go to Juco was Jimmy Bell. And that was a uh, yeah, word on the street is great. I, I'm not here to talk about anybody's performance in the classroom because mine sure. wasn't very good. Um, but also well, we don't know for sure, but, but right. Jimmy Bell, Jimmy Bell's another guy who's still playing college and, basketball. And by the way, at West Virginia and then now Mississippi state and, yes. and, and quite well from SEC this. player of the week. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that seems like something that would come in handy. I would, I mean, like talk about a Jimmy Bell, Triore, Bruce Zhang front court. Talk to me about it. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that makes a makes us look like a very different team. That is right? a completely different team. I mean that that's that's malpractice that you can't like. I I mean that that you let Jimmy Bell, and again whatever the issue is, you have to find a way to help the man and make sure he sticks around in your program. Because I mean, for Christ's sake, I mean he had a nickname, like people are <laughs> calling him the locomotive. Yeah. Like uh, he was, he was awesome. What in his limited minutes? Yeah, I think the other thing here that's that's worth noting is Traore going out to to Beach, Long yeah. Beach State. Um, he was good there right away. It was it, this wasn't a guy who like Long Beach has taken the time to develop. Oh. Like his his first season there, he plays thirty three games. He averages a double double: thirteen points, ten and a half rebounds. Uh, you know, he's a 68% free throw shooter. He's oh, shoots over 50% from the field. Um, he, he's a little bit of, sh gives you a little bit of shot blocking, a little bit of passing. Um, and it's, it's one of those things like that was right away. And no, the big West is not the a 10 and, and long beach is not slew. Like I, I get that it's kind of a step down, but like he, for two years now, he's been a double, double machine there. And you can't tell me like that doesn't translate at the a 10 to, to a, very usable player yes no i can't tell you that you're right so yeah anyway i i don't i don't know what's what's going on with each of their specific situations and the circumstances why they left but it's a little hard when we're entering this season not sure if we have a big man let alone anyone, anyone that's the least bit serviceable 
and and we're watching other former SLU players do pretty well in in other schools. Um, that that's just it's it's been hard to swallow, and I, I just don't I don't get the impatience. And um, you know, I've always said bigs take time, and I, I just don't know why why we're not giving them more time. But Zach, I kind of want to I want to ask you specifically. We've got as a Wiro now playing right. Uh, we've got Magasa not playing the season on the bench. Called it. We've got Bruce and we've got Steph who are both eligible and playing a little bit. Uh, Bruce now more so. Uh, Steph has really faded out of the rotation now that Brad is eligible. But specifically, what do you think the future is for for these uh, these big men? And 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 I guess specifically the three freshmen, because um, I, I think Azawiro would probably hang around as as yeah, an I, I think he's got no choice. Um, regardless of what happens with the coaching situation, well, I really don't know if he has a choice. The way the NCAA is moving. Um, but I mean, are we? T- I think it all depends on what happens in conference season and whether Travis Ford here is the coach. Uh, I would love to have Bruce around. Like, I think Bruce is so far ahead skillfully of any big we've ever had. Do I wish we had Rob Hornet still having the players bang weights around? Yes, I do. Because for now, I- I'm not completely sold on any of our strength and conditioning coaches the way our players get injured. Um, I, I think Steph, I, I, I'm interested to see, he continues to be less foul prone, less act like a complete goon prone, which, is, and, and please guys, I say that with love. Like I love watching him go out and beat the shit out of people. I've said it a million times. It's awesome. It's great. But like, he's turning into a little more of a, of a controlled division one big. I think every, every time he steps on the floor. Yeah, I think so. And it's it's funny because you also like the the stereotype on European players forever has been that they're soft, right? And he's yeah. the opposite of that. He's yes. the he's the fearless freshman who comes in there and will will bang with with anybody um in 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 the game for better or for worse. I think the other guy Magasa is a, a big question mark to me because he put up the kind of numbers in the second division in France that make you like raise an eyebrow and go, we might really have something here. Uh, we just, but he might not him. also be eligible. Right. So <laughs> we, we just don't know. So yeah, we don't have him for this year. Uh, I guess if all goes as planned, he would take a red shirt and then be a red shirt freshman next year. Right. I don't know. Um, but, but I think that would be the idea. Uh, but but I, I'm intrigued enough by what he did at that level, and um, th- th- that I would I kind of like to see what we have there. But yeah, Bruce reminds me a lot of a young Ian Vujukas. Mm-hmm. Uh, he came over. He's he's really skilled and polished in some ways, and then really needs to kind of catch up and learn the game in some other ways. Yeah, he he uh, needs he needs the some, speed of the game. He needs some Jordan Goodwin rebounding academy. Yeah, uh, I mean, if he can, if he can kind of shore up his rebounding a little bit, um, become a little more physical. But I, I think he's already got a good enough frame to hang. Oh yeah. So, so, so I think uh, I, I really, I really, really like him. I think you know, of all the young guys we've got, he's maybe the most intriguing overall to me. But anyway, yeah, I, I, I it always pains me a little bit when guys transfer for any reason. Uh, so, so I want the best for all. I want every guy who comes in to just be really good and happy and succeed. And, yeah. Um, and I know it doesn't work like that, but I, I, I almost like if Travis Ford is is hung on to after this year, which I think would be a major mistake. Um, but if that is the case, I I really would like to see him stand pat with his bigs, um, because it's something he hasn't done in a long time, and it seems to be kind of the the trend um where it's it's just not good uh, i I, ag- uh, I actually agree with that completely because i think if if as a wiro is this good right and like from what we've seen in these first two games if he's this good uh putting up these kind of numbers then then you do have the ability to develop guys behind him and give yeah. bruce is he what year is minutes. he so I think he he would technically be a junior. You okay. know, he's he's going to burn this year of eligibility, even though he missed some of it. He's going to burn this year of eligibility, and then next year he would be a senior. Okay, and he's behind the COVID bonus year, so he doesn't have a, like a fifth year waiting for him. Yeah, I know. I'm I know. so, uh, and we're we're rejoicing the fact that 
we're done with COVID bonus years, but we're going to get to a point where there's no, there's no, I think we may have one more year next year. I think like that would be the very end of the tail of it. Right. So we're, but we're going to start running into like where NCAA just goes to complete, like it becomes a complete free for all and we don't have (laughs) classes anymore. And yeah, but I, I I definitely am. I'm with you. I'm getting sick of like the, the late 20 somethings in the yeah in the game yeah i'm getting i'm getting sick of the the 22 23 year olds in college yeah i no, didn't no. do that i ne- <laughs> I, I would have never done that well i didn't have to a watch lot, you play Pete. uh sports um, uh, yeah uh, for all the people that watched me try to try to spit game at humphreys they were they, <laughs> they were very glad that i that i graduated didn't you go here with my older brother <laughs> uh yeah but uh you yes know. i did <laughs> uh, <laughs> i i do not recall uh no let's uh let's kick it around the league pete what do you think yeah let's do it and it was kind of a weird zach uh week zach because i think there were a couple other teams like us who maybe didn't play at all if i'm just kind of like looking through the numbers here there may have been a couple more um but we just had one game on friday the 29th and then we had uh almost everybody else go on the 30th um I don't know. I'm I'm trying to read the dots here. That maybe there were one or two others who had a long break like us. But um, regardless, on Friday the 29th, St. Joe's 97, Loyola Maryland 56. St. Joe's actually me- might be pretty good. Zach, did you know that Billy Lang said that uh, uh, that he doesn't consider St. Joe's mid major? Yes, I saw that. And so yeah, I mean, so they're low. I, they're low. This- they're they're below mid major then. <laughs> I, I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, A-10 and Mountain West and other coaches in those leagues who kind of cringe at the term. And I always have I to. Do. I, I, I don't like it. I don't like the term at all. I think it's flawed and incomplete and misapplied. But uh, anyway, yes, but I, 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 I actually language. don't mind that. I don't mind that. Um, um, go ahead with the Saturday the 30th. Yeah, a lot of games, apparently. Yeah. Um, Rhode Island 82, Northeastern, the Huskies 71, Fordham 87, Columbia 78, uh, UMass 79, Siena 66, uh, Davidson 72, Ohio 69. Nice. Uh, Loyola 73, Central Michigan 35. Pete, uh, is that, isn't that where uh, he who shall not be named started his career? Central Michigan? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Oh, I can't believe I just Googled his name. Oh, no, he, no, he's right. Oh, Eastern Washington, Eastern Washington. That's where he went after SLU. Oh, wait, where did he go then before? He started SLU. Central Michigan. Did I say? SLU was his first school. No, he played at Central Michigan. I don't, let's just, let's just keep going. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, he started at Central Michigan, bro. I don't remember that. I thought he came uh, in as a freshman. No, no. He came in as already as a douchebag. Um, Duquesne, 95. Cleary, 47. Okay. They beat Beverly Cleary. Very nice. Uh, Howard, 71. LaSalle, 66. Mason, 94. North Carolina, A&T, 69. Nice. Dayton, I read that the wrong way, and I thought it was 96 at first. And I was like, holy shit, what the hell happened? Uh, Dayton, 78. Longwood, 69. Another nice. Longwood uh, be- led at halftime, by the way. Oh, man. That had to that had to pucker up some Dayton fans. Oh, man. Uh, 87 VCU. Gardner-Webb, 73. Richmond, 59. Lafayette, 38. George Washington, 69. Maryland Eastern Shore, 63. That game was tight. Uh, Bonaventure 62, Akron 61. Speaking of tight, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. This this conference is a, is a complete joke other than Dayton. You know, the only – but you say that, but the only loss was the Howard-LaSalle game, and, and Howard's not bad. You know, LaSalle, uh, LaSalle is probably toward the bottom of our league. So, I don't know. They're some just, weird, they're just weird so weird. Number. Yeah, yeah, they're just weird scores. I mean, you look at the – I mean, that George Washington game was at home. Uh, Davidson was at home. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, there were a lot of needlessly tight games. Yeah, that's correct. We'll call that the Travis Ford. 
um, Pete, uh, let's preview the next two games. Uh, we got Loyola and George Mason. January 3rd here at home against the Ramblers, and then Saturday the 6th at George Mason. I- I'm scared for this second one because I just cannot stand to lose to George Mason. The most insufferable fan base, um, as we as we've kind of learned over time. The, they're like they're insufferable, but they stink at everything. Yeah. So when they so when they don't or when they beat you, it's like it's really annoying. Yeah. Um, Loyola, on the other hand, I don't mind their fans. I gotta say, I've, no, I've been, I don't either. I've been they're, happy. They're just they're just they're just dudes that cosplay Gryffindor. That's that's all they are, right? <laughs> uh the 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 scarves and everything yeah no what, I, by what, the way by the way incredible marketing by them yeah like i i mean it, i wish slew would do something like this like yeah. find something to grab onto with the billiken like again this this thing like the billiken's awesome use it find something yeah. Uh, but but the Ramblers are eight and five. They've got wins over Central Michigan, like we just said, Eastern Illinois, New Orleans, Boston College, Chicago State, Harvard, Charleston Southern, and Goshen, lower division school. They lost to Florida Atlantic, UIC, Creighton, Tulsa, and South Florida. I, I will acknowledge that two of those were top 10 teams at the time that they lost. Um, and as we just said a few minutes ago, the most recent game was them holding Central Michigan at just 35 points. Uh, Drew Valentine's in his third year, going twenty-five and eight that first year, and then ten and twenty-one in his second, prompting Early a lot of hot seat. Yes, uh, prompting a lot of SLU fans to ask whether he's Jim Cruz or not, um, especially after they lost a few early games this season. Um, so I don't know about that, Zach, because when I look at these losses, I mean, there there's not really like terrible losses in there. They seem to kind of win the games that they should, and then I don't know. They they you'd probably like to have that UIC or Tulsa game or maybe even the South Florida game, but um, not an entirely surprising record right now, given the schedule. Philip Alston, I think people were real remember from last season. He's just like that physically imposing 6'6", 225, solid muscle kind of dude. He averages 15.2 points a game. He's not the most efficient from outside of the free throw line, but he's pretty hard to stop when he's got it in the perim- inside the perimeter. Um, he he did miss four games back in November with an injury, but he's been back for a while now, so uh, he's healthy and ready to go. Desmond Watson, the Davidson transfer, is their second leading scorer and the only other player in double digits. He scored 11 and 13 in two games against SLU last year um, after not doing much um, against the Bills as a freshman, again at Davidson, not at Loyola. He does shoot about 39% from three and, and shoots about four attempts a game, um, so somebody that we're going to have to keep an eye on. I guess, <laughs> given our three-point defense. Braden Norris has been playing well lately. He's the fifth-year senior point guard who averages nine points and then 5.3 assists per game. I saw a couple people joke that he's been at Loyola longer than Jimerson has been at SLU. Um, I actually think it's the same amount of time, and he may be even shorter given Jimerson's redshirt um, injury year. But no, I, I actually think they're both fifth-year players. Jimerson's right? going to end up being the oldest college basketball player of all time, right? If he sticks around, if he sticks around, but I don't think he will. No. Uh, I think this is it for him. Um, Dame Adelican, am I seeing his last name right? I can't, I want to say I am, but anyway, he's the Dartmouth transfer. He averages about seven and a half points a game and four rebounds a game. He's 6'8, 230, and between him and Alston and a six foot 10 freshman named Miles Rubin, they do have some kind of versatility in the front court. They do have, also have a senior, Tom Welch, who's 6'8. And he seems to have kind of drifted further down the bench as his career has gone on. He got which, big minutes last year against us, he right? Did. So and he did. And he was kind of stunk. He, he did, but, um, you know, at the same time, yeah, he he really stunk against us. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> we beat him back. But at the same time, like, he's been there for so long that I kind of, I don't know, I just assume he'd kind of have some senior minutes. But, no, his minutes have gone down. And then they also have a sophomore guard, Jalen Quinn, a guy that slew offered. And, and I know he visited after being offered and everything. But he's deeper in the rotation as a second-year player um, than I expected as well, based on how he looked at times as a freshman. I actually thought he had a pretty good appearance against SLU in one of those games last year. Um, Jaden Dawson is another sophomore guard. I'd, I'd point out he scores just under nine points a game, and he's a pretty efficient three-point shooter. 
Um, so he's another another one who will probably look to have a good game against us. They're a solid defensive rebounding team. They don't hit the offensive glass hard, though. Uh, a relatively high share of their field goal attempts come from three. They're a surprisingly good shot blocking team, and they move the ball around well. Norris is a big part of that, obviously, that that veteran presence there. And they have a lot of experience overall with seven seniors, all all in the top um, ten or eleven in their their scoring chart. So. SLU made easy work of Loyola twice last season. We won by 17 on the road and then 19 back at home. So we've loved this rivalry so far. Uh, we beat them on the glass in both games, and Loyola really struggled to score inside. They did shoot well from three in one of those games, but they were terrible in the other. Uh, I don't know, Zach. I mean, I, we've we've played them well. There's obviously some personnel changes. We're a much different team than last season. Um, Loyola is a, a little more similar, but they're better. And so... I can't imagine that we're going to beat them by double digits twice this year. Uh, they, they, I don't know. This is to me, this is a real litmus test for both teams, honestly. And the schedule gets a lot harder after it. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it gets hard harder <laughs> right, right, right away uh, because George Mason's next. Uh, by the way, I think we win. I, I think we win both games this year. I think it's just very close against Loyola. Uh, yeah, I do. I I would probably pick. We we're gonna need to both of them. If if, if Travis Ford, if, if I think that's right. Yeah, I'm not gonna say it again. But you, you like if we lose that first one out of the gate, and then oh, uh, buddy, then, then 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 we have I think the hardest stretch of our entire A10 schedule after that. Uh, you know, five game stretch or so. I, that's that's where I think it's a it's, it's a potentially, panic panic button yeah, time right. But if we win that Loyola game, then I, I would feel a lot better. So I would like anyway. to win it by double digits. Of course. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I think like that's we need to. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I would like to for sure. Um, George Mason, on the other hand, they're really surprising. I think eleven and two under first year head coach Tony Skin. Uh, I with hate win- that name. I hate that name. <laughs> he seems like a pretty good dude. I, I you know, I don't sure know. Sure, he is, but he's a stupid name. They've they've beaten Monmouth, Austin P, Cornell, South Dakota State, East Carolina, and JIT, your favorite school, uh, <laughs> T- Toledo, Loyola, Maryland, um, North Carolina A and T, and then a lower division team. They've only lost they to didn't Charlotte. Even mention it. <laughs> no, I mean it was uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's just Little funny. Virginia just, College. Yeah, go game. on, yeah, whatever. Go on. Um, They've only lost to Charlotte on a neutral floor and then number Tennessee, number 17 Tennessee on the road. They're actually undefeated at home, Eagle Bank Arena, where this game is going to happen. So that kind of makes me nervous. Um, they they start the A-10 slate against LaSalle the same night we play Loyola on the third. Keyshawn Hall is their best player. He's a 6'7", 250 wing. For, he's a transfer from UNLV. He averages about 16.2 points a game and nine and a half rebounds a game. Three-level scorer, good size. A really impressive get, by the way, in the transfer portal. Um, Darius Maddox is a 6'5 junior guard. He averages 13.6 and 3.8 rebounds. He played his first three seasons at Virginia Tech. Really good shooter. He shoots 42% from the arc and 94% from the free throw line. So uh, he can. He's kind of the. He kind of puts up the percentages that I would like to see from Jimerson at this point in the season. Uh, honestly, I mean, he's just a, a really lethal shooter. Amari Kelly, 6'9", senior, averaging 12 and 7. Um, if you recognize the name, it's because he started out at Duquesne back in the fall of 2018. Speaking of Jesus guys who been in the game. Jesus Christ! Yeah, been in the game forever. Bro, he red- he's older than my podcasting career. <laughs> he redshirted his second season, stayed at Duquesne for his third year, and then he played two at UNC Wilmington before ending up at uh, George Mason as a grad transfer. He's a pretty efficient scorer. He's a good rebounder. He's even a threat to shoot, step out and shoot a three on occasion. He does get into foul trouble sometimes, though. So I would, uh, you know, I, I, I'm really curious to see the matchup between him and Brad. Um, Ronald Polite is back for his fourth season. He's scoring 8.6 points a game. And then they have a, player, a pair of players averaging just over seven points each. A freshman guard named Baraka Okoji and a senior forward named Woody Newton, who actually had a slew offer back in high school. There's some Jordan. great names on this team. Like low-key great. Ronnie Polite sounds like a character in a movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I like it. I like it. Um, and then, yeah, so, so Newton, uh, George Mason is his third school after Syracuse and Oklahoma State. 
Mason's a pretty interesting defensive team. They absolutely lock it down inside the arc. They hold teams to 40% shooting. They actually led the nation in that stat a week ago, and now they're third. Uh, but they don't force many turnovers at all, less than 10 a game. They just have a really disciplined, stay-home approach on defense, which, you know, honestly, we've seen slew coaches in the past play. Um, they really try and play a slow game overall. They try to limit possessions and control the pace, you know, at both ends, obviously. They're a good rebounding team, especially on the defensive end. Um, and and Zach, I got to say, overall, the vibes are really positive out of Fairfax. Skin is an alum. He's class of 2006, just a year after me. And he is a, a bunch of transfers that are clicking um, within a really disciplined, defensive-minded approach. He's got some recruiting wins for next year already as well. So I got to say he looks like a great hire out of the gate so far. Uh, but then again, so did Drew Valentine, and that's become more questionable. So we'll we'll see where it goes from here for him. But I, I'm, re- I'm always impressed where a first-year coach, like we saw against Utah State, has a team full of transfers that really play well together. Um, I, I always find that really impressive, and it seems like that's what he's doing. And, uh, and yeah, we go into an arena where they have not lost yet. So not looking forward to this game, Zach. Nope, 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 nope. Um, you know, talk about a game that, uh, that people were looking forward to, and then it just kind of fizzled out. And, and I think Travis Ford was looking forward to it too, was, uh, uh, Vianney's game, uh, at the coach, was it coaches versus cancer? Is that what that was? It, it was, it's the Webster Groves tournament, right? Yeah. Well, uh, well whatever it was anyway. Yeah, I that's, I, I mean, ju- like, you can't, like, this just adds to, like, the number of just weird, stupid things that have happened in the past year under mm-hmm. this, under the current regime. So you're talking about Ford going to, to watch a high school team, and then both of the players that we have offered had to sit out the game because they were suspended uh, from the game before, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I have... <laughs> I've gotten, uh, I guess, some of the accounts of what may have happened between Viani and Desmet, and uh, it seems like Zach that it may have not just involved Luke Walsh and Eddie Smajic, who who slew have offered on Viani, both of those guys, but it involved uh, the Suns and the man himself, uh, former Billiken John Duff from Desmet, uh, from from what I hear. So it was, it sounded like quite a uh, situation between Vianney and Desmet. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's just what you'd expect from those schools, but nonetheless, I, I think it's, it's pretty, I, it's for, it's definitely a forehead slapping moment for me that, that Ford ends up going to that game. Um, after seemingly we, why we really would he have not would, is there another reason he would be at that game? Well, who, so, so Vianney played Desmet the game that before night. Who were they playing in this game? It was uh I don't even remember. So there there may have been I, I mean, mean you I'm, I'm gonna have to bring up their schedule, but yeah, I, I mean like I don't understand though, like he just shows up like we literally have like on good authority that uh, the slew hasn't really been in contact with either of those guys since, since offering. Offer. Right. Yeah, yeah, so this um this was they played okay, so they this was all out at Maryville. Sorry, I said Webster Girls tournament, yeah. I had the wrong tournament. They were all playing out at Maryville. So Vianni beat Eureka the first night, then they played Desmet and lost, and they had the big brouhaha the second night. And Hickman. so they played Hickman, Columbia Hickman the third night, who I don't know a lot about. I mean, I, I guess they I'm they have really... they have a guy named Isaiah Bonaparte, which is pretty freaking cool. That is cool. I'm not sure. I'd have to do a little homework on some of these names to see if Hickman might have a dude. Um, you know, they've got, I'm seeing some 2024 players here, but anyway, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, he, he was, maybe he was finding another uh, uh, Billiken adjacent mascot to be mad about in the QPs. The QPs. I, I forgot that that's what Hickman was. That's it's better fun. than the orphans across the river. Centralia, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. That I think that's because um, that that's got to be the same, right? It's still they can't get rid of that one. No, just, the orphans, yeah, you can't. So I'm, yeah, I'm looking at their roster. 
They got a lot. They have a lot of players. They have like a C team, dude. Oh, I guess that's freshman. No, I don't think about it. Yeah, that would be the freshman team. But anyway, yeah. So we, you know, what was not prepared to talk about it necessarily, but no. um, regardless, it 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 didn't wind up being the best night to go see uh, Vianney play. No. Pete, let's get into A10 Survivor Picks. This was a ton of fun last year to do on the show, and we're going to try to do it again this uh, this year, Pete. And I think we're going to talk it out on air. Uh, we're going to try to figure out our picks together, maybe add a little bit of entertainment, uh, <laughs> entertainment value for the people at home. Uh, but uh, yeah. I, I have not looked at the schedule. I lost the window actually because I'm a terrible co-host here. That's so, right. I, I got while you bring it back up, yep. I've got the first slate of games right here. So this first the first week of the survivor pool will cover the games played between January 3rd and January 10th. It's basically a Wednesday to Wednesday um uh, time frame that we do. It's not not based on the week, the actual week, the weekend. Um, so obviously we know we've got the the Loyola at SLU game on the first Wednesday night, the third. We've also got George Mason at LaSalle. We've got Dayton at Davidson. George Washington hosting Fordham. UMass hosting Duquesne. Rhode Island hosting St. Joe's. And VCU will host St. Bonaventure. So this is a pretty interesting slate of games on on opening night zach i tend to like a lot of the teams that are on the road that night so we have do we have to pick one a week or two a week i think so the way this works is we pick one a week and okay. then we'll do, you do one i do one and then the podcast yep. does one. all right so uh is there what are you seeing from this night for your own that, that you that you like well, just based on this night, and we do have three more games or three more dates full yes. of games to pick. Um, a lot of if, dates. If I were just looking at this night, though, uh, we'll... so does does this include the St. Joe's Slough game? What? Uh, sorry, the, the Loyola so, Slough game. You mean? No. So this goes from January third to January 9th, technically. Yeah, I don't know if he has it wrong. Like it should be the ninth or tenth. Okay. Because then he has the eleventh to seventeenth. So I would I would assume that the tenth is included. Um. Yeah. I. Yeah, that's right. I th I think he that's how he does have it for the first week. So it'll okay. end it'll end on a Thursday every week. So then it'll, it. yeah, eleven to seventeenth, eighteen to twenty four, mm -hmm. and so forth. Okay. So cool. the first the, so this first week technically has an extra day. I think that's yes. that's what's going on here. So what so, do you uh, like here this week? You know, Give me I don't a couple know, you like. Well, let, let's let's go through the other dates first, just so we have those options kind of thrown out there. On Saturday the sixth, you've got um, that's the day that SLU plays at George Mason, mm -hmm. LaSalle at Fordham. You know, typically the two best teams in conference, right? Uh, um, yes. Duquesne is at Loyola, and then Bonaventure's at Richmond. VCU's at home again against George Washington. Um, Sunday the seventh, the only game is UMass at Dayton, and then you've got a couple games on Tuesday the ninth: uh, Ro Rhode Island at Davidson, VCU at George Mason, Richmond at Loyola, and then the last day, the tenth, that would be like you said, St. Joe's at SLU, and then um, LaSalle is at UMass. So if I'm going to give you a game that immediately What's, jumps. Yeah. Yeah, give jumps me out at me here. I'm going to say Davidson at home against Rhode Island on Tuesday okay. the ninth. Okay. Is one that I, looks solid to me. I was going to say uh, VCU at home uh, against George Washington on Saturday. Yeah. Yes, I like yeah, that. That's one. a good one. That one stands out. I I do like your call. Uh, what is it? Who's at home against Rhode Island? Yeah. So da that one, Davidson. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Rhode Island is on the road. Yeah, uh, that's on Tuesday the 9th at Davidson. Okay. I so like so that. that's a solid one. I I you know, for myself I'm actually kind of looking at maybe I use a team like George Washington early so I can kind of sit on some of the better teams in conference um because on the 3rd they are hosting Fordham who seems to stink okay. this year. Okay, I so, like that. So, so that might be that might be one to consider as well. 
um, if if you're looking not to use all the best teams right away. Yeah, uh, I, man. I mean, I wasn't try. I, I thought about. I like UMass maybe giving it a run. You okay, know, which game? Because uh, they play. I, I kind of like UMass at home against LaSalle. Okay. Yeah. Because UMass is mid to good. Right. They play at Dayton on Sunday the seventh. That's one of well. those when you're not looking. If you're not looking to use one of the the best teams. Right. Uh, is there one? That you would pick like outside the box, like Dark Horse. If you got to pick a road team, let's say you got to pick a road team. If I had to pick a road team, um, oh god, would it would would you would you get mad at me to say St. Joe's at SLU? <laughs> no, I mean I I am also kind of looking at Richmond at Loyola. Okay, on, on uh, Tuesday the ninth. Um, Duquesne another... at Loyola. Duquesne at Loyola is another one where, yeah, I mean, Duquesne's supposed to be better than Richmond, right? Yeah. Um, even though I think Rich, uh, and actually, yeah, I mean, Richmond is a team that really punishes bad defenses, but they can kind of, you know, Loyola is a pretty good defensive team. So maybe Duquesne at Loyola is, is the even better pick there. And I don't know about VCU though. Like, I don't know if VCU is cream of the crop. I don't know either. They're eight and five. They've got a first year coach. They've looked really bad a few times. Um, although they've generally looked better as the season has gone on. Okay. Pete, let's come to a consensus for the podcast first, and then we go from there, I think. Yeah. So, all right, what's 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 the strongest pick for the podcast? Are we just going to go the absolute strongest pick for the podcast just to keep the podcast in as long as possible? I tend to be, I would, I would probably be a little more conservative if I'm sharing. Okay. You know, I like, um, it. I like it. Um, I think I, I think it's conservative, but not overly conservative to go with that VCU George Washington game. Okay. I also think Davidson at Rhode Island is conservative, but a little, it's got a little risk to it. Um, you mean Rhode Island at Dave, Davidson? Yeah. Sorry. Davidson at home. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I think the most risk is, I think, I don't know. What do you think about those two? Yeah, I, I like both of those. Okay. Um, you know, it's a coin flip. I would be, ha I would happily use either of those for myself as well. Um, okay. Let's see here. V uh, oh, VCU's got Bonaventure to start the week. So you're talking about VCU, George Washington next week. Mm -hmm. Wait, what day is that? What, what year is it? That's Saturday. Um, VCU George Washington would be Saturday. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead. Joe, no, you 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 make the call, I think. I'm more oh man, their records kind of bother me. George Washington being eleven and two and VCU being eight and five. Yeah. Um, uh yeah. I, I I just think I, uh, I just think I just think Rhode Island's clearly worse. Okay. Okay, we can go with Davidson uh, at home versus Rhode Island. But again, I don't trust uh, Matt McKillop. No, I mean I don't either. But I think Rhode Island stinks. So how does Rhode Island stink under Archie? In year two, they shouldn't be this bad. No, I can't wait till we hire him. But I I don't know. I think I think Davidson at home is is pretty solid there, and I, I don't quite know yet how good. Um. VCU, VCU is. is, and I, I will say Davidson has lost or has won their last seven. They haven't lost since that St. Mary's okay. game. I like it. Davidson, lock it in. Yeah, let's let's do that one. Let's do Davidson at home. All right. What are you going for yours? For mine, I might go ahead and go with a little bit riskier one. Another team okay. that I'm I'm not super confident in, but I think they're going to hold home court. And You're that's not going to do it. You're going to do what? it, aren't you? George Washington over oh. Fordham. Oh, I thought you were going to go George Mason over SLU. No, no, oh. I'm, I'm going to leave SLU out this week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't quite know how good we are yet either. Um, I'm I'm going to go with George Washington over Fordham at home. Wow. Uh, I just I just think that is risky. You're playing with fire there, brother. Two teams who didn't play the toughest non-conference schedule. I know I'm playing with fire with George Washington, but 
they're another team. They've won five in a row. They're at home. They're playing a Fordham team that's just not great. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to go with that one. And that way I still have my Dayton's and my VCU's and, you know, some of the other teams that should be better. Yeah. I think I, I hate to do this because it's going to push me into next week, but I think I'm going to go with UMass over LaSalle. Interesting. UMass yeah. at home or is that yes. on the road? UMass okay. at home versus okay. LaSalle. Gotcha. And yeah, so, yeah, you, so we have, me, UMass versus LaSalle. Uh-huh. Uh, you are. Uh, I'm George Washington over Fordham. GW versus Fordham. And then mm-hmm. the pod is Davidson versus. Who is it? D- uh, you, uh, I almost Rhode said Island. UMass. Rhode Island. Sorry. Yes. Are, all right. We got it locked in. Midtown Madness Podcast, A10 Survivor Pool, Picks of the Week. The podcast has Davidson versus Rhode Island. I have UMass versus LaSalle. Peter has George Washington versus Fordham. So that's our picks. But do you know what the pick is always a unanimous pick, Pete? It's two men in a garden. (laughs) Always unanimous, Zach. And I got to point out something I noticed when I when I picked some up this uh, this this past couple of weeks or I guess two weeks ago now that I was in town, um, they kind of changed their label a little bit. I do. So the the medium specifies that it's jalapeno peppers, and the hot specifies that it's habanero peppers. And at first, <clears throat> I saw the label and I was like, "Ooh, is this like a is this like a variant of their medium? Is it different?" And then I realized. Because I still had um, an old, an older label jar at home as well. That it's just that's just the different pepper they use for the different heat level. Habanero being a hot, hotter pepper. Um, so anyway, just something to keep an eye out for if you're picking up two men in a garden in a local uh, a local retailer anytime soon. I think they're still new enough to where they have you could still find the old and the new labels depending on where you go. Still well within date code and everything like that. Not a concern, but just to highlight that. I thought it was pretty interesting. You can pick up the medium, the hot, or any other of their very good salsas at twominutegarden.com or at any St. Louis area grocery store. Let's move over to the women's side of things. And and they finished off conference play on, on kind of a down note. Um, it was a 65 or 63-58 loss. First Rhode Island on Saturday the 30th. Pete. Rhode Island was the preseason favorite to win the A-10. Uh, I, I certainly can excuse a loss to Rhode Island, but it's one of those where you really want to see, uh, you really want to see that pick up that win at home against a top conference foe. You really do, Zach, and especially like the way that this game went. Right? It was it was their first home game in in three weeks. Uh, we already mentioned that Tenen Magasa was in town to reunite with her brother Abu, but she was out with injury. And so we didn't really get to see her play. And she's typically been a starter for them, um, but she's been out the last few games. This was a winnable game. So as, as much as you say like, that's okay. They they were projected to win the conference or picked to win the conference. I should say um, it was definitely within our reach. Slew had a 30 to 22 lead at halftime. What kind of half it was depends on who you ask. The Rhode Island game recap called it an ugly half of basketball all around. And then the SLU recap just kind of broke down every scoring run, um, which which I thought was pretty funny. They got a lot more colorful in their write-up. Uh, I guess I'll put it that way. But really, Zach, like th- this, d- were you able to watch this game or, or or see it in person or anything? Because you know it, it was kind of a tough one to swallow. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was able to watch a lot of it. Uh, it really just felt like it was uh, frenetic paced. Yeah, uh, a lot of uh, turnovers, a lot of just, you know, I mean, there were some really nice plays. I think there was a, a great pass and finish from uh, Kennedy, uh, from Ken Calhoun to Peyton Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was just gorgeous. I thought uh, there were some really great plays from Julia Martinez. But I mean, this game was just a kind of a dogfight. It was just yeah. gross. 
It, it was. I, I think, honestly, I think the ugliest thing was the shooting. You know, like the, the turnover number wasn't too out of control, but you look at the first half and Rhode Island was seven of 22 from the field and one of eight from three. Um, you look overall for the game, Slew shot just over 38%. They were under 20% from three, 64% from the line. Rhode Island, they, I think they had one fewer make from than Slew. They were 37%, 22% from feet, the, the three-point line, and then uh, 61% from the free throw line. So that's to me where it was ugliest overall. Um, but the but the most frustrating thing about this, Zach, is it was just Rhode Island's offensive rebound. That was the the difference in the game. You know, yeah. we're up eight at halftime. Brody goes on the the a run to take a lead in the third quarter, <clears throat> and then they mostly held on to it the rest of the way, not because they got hot, but because they hit the offensive glass that hard, or or I guess Slew didn't you know get defensive rebounds like they should have. At one point in the third quarter, Rhode Island had eight offensive boards and Slew had seven total rebounds. Uh, which is hor- horrible for the game. They finished with 45 total rebounds, 16 on the offensive end, and Slew was 12 behind them with 33 total rebounds, seven offensive rebounds. Had they been able to actually get those defensive rebounds, I think this game goes the other way. Slew got to within two late in the fourth quarter, despite all that. I mean, so th- so that's that's really to me that was like the whole story of this game. I really think this is where the 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 attitude surrounding SLU women's basketball differs from SLU men's basketball. There's that hope there. There's that feeling that we're in games, no matter like, like I think there was a point in this game where I think SLU was down seven or eight. And I go, ah, shit, this one's over. I was like, wait a minute. No, no wrong team. Like this team can jump the gap. Yeah, they're they're never really out of a game that's uh, that's like kind of a 10, 12 point game or less. Right. There have been teams that have kind of blown them out a little bit, and that you know those got away from them. But <clears throat> it really takes a lot for this team to just be out of a game. They're they're capable of some some you know yeah. really big runs. And On I the think other hand, it has a lot to do with the defense, uh, the that the ball hawking ability of Julia Martinez. I thought uh, who was it? Uh, Peyton Kennedy jumped. Jumped a pass in this one that was incredible. Yeah, yeah, so, Mar- and Mar- Martinez is obviously always the, the the big part of that, right? I mean, like right. she's such a frustrating player to play against. Like, like she never quite know what she's going to do. And um, you know, Calhoun's been really good as that other guard who really kind of gets low, creates steals, um, knows how to create some havoc. Uh, you know, with with Martinez to put some pressure on a on another backcourt, but like. You know, at the same time, there is when they give up points. A lot of times, it happens pretty fast because that 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 pressure can lead to some holes in the in the defense as well. So, I don't know. Just one of those games where, you know, no, I don't think anyone was really feeling it, um, really for either team. But uh, Slu just didn't do enough to make up for it, especially on the glass. Yeah, I think you look back. I think this is one of those games where you can, you know, obviously. Uh, Rhode Island is picked top of the conference. They're cream of the crop. They have been for for almost a decade, I'm sure, even longer. But mm-hmm. you look at this game, in the context of what we saw last year in the home opener of the A-10, and it was, I mean, <laughs> uh, that Loyola game was one of the worst basketball games I've ever attended. Yeah, uh, I, and, I know so, you've, you've brought that one up a bunch, but I, I forgot that was the home opener uh it was not wait it was early uh, e- yes it was it was it okay. was yeah uh, it was december 28th in fact so it was two days i guess it was a year and two days if you want to call it that sure sure, sure. um yeah. but it was a, it was a 23 point loss to loyola chicago the worst team in the a10 last year uh so so clearly we have a team that has potential that is playing at a like that has already got its shit together. Like that team last year did not have it together at all. Uh, and then they did eventually. Uh, but uh, we, we have a higher jumping point. So mm-hmm. I, I think we're in good shape heading into the A-10. Um, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. It's just a matter of like, okay, that team goes on this. <clears throat> unbelievable run to conclude a 10 play into the conference tournament. 
and you wonder what can get them to kind of sustain that level again like we watched them go toe to toe with a very good a10 team and now it's it's it'll mostly get easier from there but you know what how do you how do you sort of clean things up a little bit to where you know those other games are going to be wins right um you know, again, nobody really feeling it in this game. Kyla McMakin had 14 and four. Peyton Kennedy had 13 and four. Julio Martinez, 12 points, seven rebounds, five assists. You know, does a little bit of everything as always. Martinez, McMakin, and Calhoun all did get into foul trouble with four each. Slew definitely did not get any home cooking in this game. Um, they were plus six in fouls on the night, and there were some really bad calls against them, I thought. Um, Maybe not the difference in the game. I still think that was the rebounding, but still a little frustrating to see, especially at home. And then um, Rhode Island's best player, Maya Toure, went down with uh, an injury in the third quarter. Um, She finished with eight and nine in 22 minutes. So another factor where maybe you thought we could have uh, capitalized on on them being down a player a little bit. Um, I don't. I don't. Swung the other way. I don't want to get on Colin Surrey because he does a phenomenal job. But the way he said Torre, I, I don't like I, something about it was off for me. I don't know. He, he's probably right, but it was just bothering me the entire game. I how think did, the name, did, I think Maya Torre as a name bothers me. It just doesn't, I don't hear it right or something. She's also got accent marks on both her first and last name. Right, right. So like, I, I, think, I, I, I'm expecting probably, Maya yeah. Torre. Like Maya Torre, right? And, but Maya Torre is bothered. I don't know. It just bothered me the entire game. So um, she's actually one of six players on their team from France. Believe it or not, six players. Ten Magasa is obviously another one. Yes, but um, I don't know. I don't know how you wind up with like like a literal half French roster in Rhode Island. I thought that was pretty weird. Uh, French is always hard to pronounce, though. I I, I stink at it. It reminds me. It, it probably reminds them some of the uh, the islands and and wait, no, are there islands in France? No, there's not. That's Italy. I'm thinking of the Italian coast. Never mind. Yeah. Anyway. Um. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It, it's it's a decent start, and um, yeah, I don't know. P, what do you think? Well, I mean, it's their fourth straight loss, right? They go to five and nine on the year. They're zero and one in conference play. If I'm if I'm looking for a positive sw- spin, we've already kind of covered it. Rhode Island was picked to win the league, and this game shows that they can play with them. Anyone in the league, really, if you're, you know, taking the the, the first place team down to the wire. The negative spin is this is a home game. Uh, Rhode Island was missing a key player to start the game, and then lost their best player in the third quarter. And so you'd like to think that this would be one that we could grab under those circumstances because it's going to be a lot harder when we go to Rhode Island, um, which I believe I believe SLU does because they were <clears throat> given yep. a little bit tougher uh, schedule as a reward for last season's uh, you know performance. So yeah, we will play at Rhode Island on February 11th. So I think there's there's a way to spin this either way, but it's this next week, Zach, that I think is going to be the really big test, and that's. Wednesday the 3rd at Loyola, Saturday the 6th at UMass. We'll know a lot more about this team after those games and uh, whether or not it's time to to hit the panic button or to uh, to settle into a, a strong top four kind of finish. Yeah, I, I want to give a, uh, you know, a little shout out to the athletic department and the women's basketball staff here because I do like that they've done a lot of uh, theme nights yeah. Um, you know, they've got uh, uh remind me not to go to the Billikens era tour though. Remind me when that one is because I'm not going to that one. I'm gonna skip the Taylor Swift night. Um How dare you. but uh, yeah, I know. Well, I, you know, I'm a hater. Uh I, I should just come up with a great anti-Taylor Swift soundbite to get people angry. Just like Big Cat, just follow the big cat plan of attack. Uh but like faculty and staff night's great, like Girl Scout night is great. Uh, again, Billiken's era tour. I hate it, but like it's good. People are going to show up for that. Sure. Uh, pink out alumni game. I feel like the eras tour and like the alumni game should be similar. By the way, if if for the eras tour night, if they don't have a better like giveaway than the t shirt that they gave out like at, at the beginning of the last women's basketball season at uh, West Pine Gym, I'm going to be so angry. Like I'm mad that I just found the shirt. Uh, because it would have been great in this uh, blanket. 
Mm. Have you? Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember that no, shirt? No, I it was not. uh It was like the. Um, it was like uh It was like a concert tour shirt. It was a t- tour t shirt. Okay. Like a band tour t shirt that was like the last. What I guess like a like the re, not the reunion tour, but it was like the, you know, like the Elton John's final tour or whatever the goodbye tour. Sure. Uh, and it had a picture of like like a grainy black and white photo of uh west pine gym it's very cool i gotta I like find that. it i'll yeah. try to see i, I, I don't think i've ever seen that shirt but i like the concept of it yeah I, if they don't put out like a like a t-shirt like a like a, a concert t-shirt then they're missing out then they've then they, something's gone wrong um it's sell it screw it sell it for 10 bucks five bucks whatever i don't know um yeah uh i, I think we're gonna be okay uh next up uh they have uh, a, a road game against Loyola. Uh, I think they've been playing well as of late, but I'm not entirely sure, Pete. Yeah, Loyola. Um, I don't know, actually. Let me I take haven't... a look here. This is bad radio, people. <laughs> and of course, my... Yeah, well, they're 6-6 six and six overall. 0-1 and one in conference with a loss to Bonaventure. It was a 12-point loss. Remember, Bonaventure was taken over by their old... Uh, yeah, that's old, right. That old the guy who kind of built that program. They lost to uh number four Iowa by 29. Oh but yeah. I think, didn't they lead at halftime? They led at halftime. That I don't know. I, I honestly find that hard to believe. Uh it was let's see. 30 no, uh, no, it was 51 to 46 at halftime. Yeah, so it was close, but I mean, you're talking yeah. about a Caitlin Clark. Yes, twenty-eight to fifteen and nineteen-eight in the in the final two quarters to to, right. to run away. But hey, Loyola seems to be a little bit improved. They at least hung with Iowa for. They played a tough schedule. Yeah, they too, really have. So, yeah, um, they beat SIUE seventy-seven seventy-four on field trip day at Gentile Arena. Um, I like it. They, it looks uh, like they've got a lot of themes there too. Yes. Uh, camper reunion is kind of cool too. Anyway, uh, Pete, I, I think that's it. Oh, they play Saturday the 6th at UMass as well. UMass being another one of those teams that kind of really does well on the women's side of things. They do. They were really good last year. They're not as good this year. Um, I think they lost a lot to graduation, but, uh, uh the A10 women's basketball, I think is having a moment. It's getting better. I mean, it's definitely getting better. I, I looked at the net rankings coming into last week's show, and uh, we, there were there were some teams with kind of a lane to at least get, you know, NIT if not. Oh my God, UMass is two and eleven. Right, they lost everybody. Holy shit! Yeah, yeah, they they really fell off. But, Dayton, um, what is Dayton doing? Like Dayton is in a like they. It's I think it's time to start hitting the panic button, dude. Well, it's year, they're also year two with a new coach, and uh, uh, that, that that's a that that is, I I mean, from what they like, they made a, I, I think they might have, to be fair, they might have made the hire that I would have made, uh, if I was the day. So, you know, but I I do think it might be time to hit the panic button in the in the Gem City. Is it the Gem City? It is. Okay, cool um yeah i think that does it pete i think it does zach uh, i just want to say happy new year to everybody and uh thanks for listening to the show as we bring it into another calendar year and right. as zach says leave comments right zach yes absolutely comment tweet at us uh you know uh, it's it's gonna be uh, hopefully 2024 is better than 2023 uh for billiken basketball uh, because 2023 might have been the the most uh, you know disheartening year I think in Billiken in in the last you know decade of Billiken basketball. Sure. Well, yeah. I, since I, well, Jim Cruz, since Jim Cruz was like, go. Yeah. Okay. So the last uh, you know seven or eight years then. Yes. That's All right. fair. Yeah. Um, hey, new year, same same thing as always. Hey, Bill. Thank you.